uh, Senator Warner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing. Chair Powell, it's, it's great to see you again. Thank you for the good work you're doing. Uh, I think in response to Grand Senator Pastor's questions, and when you were talking about um, the kind of investments we ought to be making that are that are long term, um, and particularly as we're thinking about infrastructure, one of the areas and understanding what my friend Senator Scott just said in your answer that you don't want to weigh in on the on the, the president's most recent plan. I would like you though to comment um, uh, whether you believe that broadband investments fall into that category kind of long-term structural change we we need. I would argue over the last 11 months we've seen the broadband is a necessity. Uh, I think it is absolutely COVID related. I I hope that uh, the current package uh, can be changed to actually include a sizable investment in broadband is as good as our um, four packages, bipartisan packages have been to date. Uh, the broadband investment has been meager or non-existent. Um, experts like Tom Wheeler and Blair Lemon have said somewhere in the 40 to $50 billion range, we could get about 97% coverage along with um, better affordability. Um, so I guess I'm asking, would you agree that immediate efforts to, co uh, to close the broadband gap not only um, represent, con represent long-term investments, but also have some direct relationship to the current health care crisis? So as you and I have discussed uh, on a number of occasions, I, I, I would agree that um, broadband is kind of a classic uh, 21st century infrastructure and one of those things that that can support growth but I, I of course can't go anywhere near don't want to go anywhere near uh, the question of what should be included in, in the package that's okay what about the what about the the question though you know from a macroeconomic standpoint um, broadband and trying to close the digital divide if we're going to have a fulsome recovery across all uh, socioeconomic groups. Um, could you speak to the question of the necessity for broadband uh, to be ubiquitous if we're going to have that kind of robust recovery and uh, comments about whether broadband is a, at this point, a nice to have or an economic necessity, whether it's telework, telehealth, uh, or teleeducation. No, so again, as you and I have discussed on a number of occasions, I, I would agree that it's it's it is a it's a classic piece of infrastructure for the modern economy, for the service economy, for the technologically advanced economy, and having it broadly available just would uh, could mean as broadly available as possible is is can could be a significant benefit economically. If, if not broadly available, um, are we going to be able to see the kind of of um, broad based uh, recovery that uh, I think we're all looking for. Well, I think we have longer, we have a bunch of issues to deal with uh, that relate to uh, these persistent disparities that we see to do with education and, and uh, training and all those things. And But that would certainly be one of those things. Um, Senator Scott, uh, in his previous line of questioning, uh, raised the inflation issues. And I know we've seen um, uh, a, on the, about a 41 basis point increase on on some of our bench 10-year uh, benchmarks. It's still relatively small. I tend to agree. I think we do need to make a sizable investment right now. I'm not sure the, in, the inflation risk, I agree with you, are not as high as potentially might be. Could you just briefly give some of the tools you've got available as Federal Reserve Chair if you started to see um, inflation rise at a level that you didn't feel comfortable with? Well, those are the classic tools that, that we have. Um, and uh, again, I really do not expect that we'll be in a situation where inflation rises to trouble, troubling levels. At this point, the committee, Federal, Federal Market Committee, is seeking inflation running moderately above 2% for some time. Um, so the real question is as we go through this, are we going to find ourselves in a situation where inflation expectations are de anchored? And and inflation is moving up and is persistent. And I, I think we're all very, you know, acquainted with the history of, of how we got into that situation in the 1970s. We did that in the 1960s, and it, uh, we, we, we have no intention of repeating that. So we, central banks and the Fed learned 
how to keep it, that the, the centrality of keeping inflation under control. We know how to do that. Just and that's just by by not uh, allowing the economy to to just ignore constraints over time. But I think this is not a problem for this for this time as as uh, as near as I can figure. And if it does turn out to be, then then we do have the tools we need. We're down to my, my last 20 seconds and now, but let me just, do you want to make some general comments? I mean, I would argue that the pandemic was the first major real world stress test we've had on our fiscal system since 2009. How do you think overall the, the system has responded? And recognizing Mr. Chairman, that'll be my last question. He's obviously, you may want to take that one for the record, but if you want to make some general comments quickly. You meant, you meant financial system, I think, right? Right, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, well, I, I, I think the, the the large financial institutions that are at the at the heart of our financial system proved resilient. Uh, they did, and uh, they've been able to keep lending. And uh, their capital levels have actually gone up during this period. As I mentioned, their liquidity levels are, are at highs. So I think um, I think that the work that we did over the course of the last decade and then and some uh, has held up pretty well so far, and I expect it will continue to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Uh, thank you, Senator Warner. 